This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with Olaf Carlson Wee. Uh, he is the founder of Polychain, and he was also the first employee uh, at Coinbase. So he's been in this space for quite a long time. And Polychain, for those who haven't seen the news, it has been covered quite a few times recently. It's kind of a new hedge fund or investment fund that's investing in in different ICOs and different tokens. Uh, so kind of this new beast of a uh, venture capital hedge fund type uh, institution. So thanks so much for coming on, Olaf. Yeah, thanks for having me. So Olaf, you've been uh, uh, in the blockchain, in the Bitcoin space for a very long time. Do you mind sharing with us, like how do you originally hear about it and how did you get started in this whole field? Yeah, absolutely. So I heard about Bitcoin in mid-2011 and pretty much was immediately sort of enamored uh, with the technology and kind of the prospects of a true programmatic money source that was controlled basically by nodes on the internet instead of a centralized entity, which I think was um, obviously a a completely new type of technology. So I uh, became pretty convinced pretty quickly that this was the most important technology that I might see in my lifetime. And um, so I started reading a lot about it. And that was kind of, yeah, summer of 2011. And I kind of went down the rabbit hole there um, and, you know, wired most of my meager life savings, being an indebted college student, uh, to Japan um, to purchase Bitcoin, buying Bitcoin with cash and all sorts of things like that. So um, I decided that I liked the concept so much and was so fascinated by it that I actually wanted to complete my undergraduate thesis on Bitcoin. So I was going into my senior year at university um, that that fall of 2011, and I decided to complete my undergraduate thesis on cryptocurrency at that time. What, what were you majoring in? Uh, sociology. Okay, interesting. And what was the reception by uh, your thesis supervisors and the academics there on that topic? So it took a bit of convincing, to say the least. I think at that time, Bitcoin was incredibly nascent. So uh, writing a research thesis, right, on something where there's clearly not a lot of research um, from the traditional academic world, at least, um, definitely was a hard sell. Uh, But that said, I I, I do think that my professors were able to wrap their heads around it and say, you know, this is obviously very interesting. So um, given that, we kind of grabbed some um, theory from other areas and from uh, computer science and kind of applied that to Bitcoin. And so was, what was the approach then? Because I mean, back back in 2011, this was very much a sort of economic, viewed as an economical experience or a, uh, a computer science experiment. So experiment. What, what was your approach from the sociological point of view? Yeah, I was thinking a lot about uh, what are the implications um, if a kind of non-state, non-bank based internet uh, value store, which can communicate between machines, were to grow in size by a million times. Um, Really, what would be the implications there? And I think uh, we've seen some of this played out. I I think I was probably mostly wrong uh, in 2011. I think it's uh, the space has expanded a lot more quickly than I anticipated. Um, But yeah, it was it was mostly kind of what are the implications for society and for individuals if that happens. And then so you went on to live on Bitcoin purely for uh, for a little while. Can you tell us a bit about that experience? Yeah, absolutely. So. When I joined Coinbase, I opted into being paid exclusively in Bitcoin. And I was paid in Bitcoin at Coinbase for three and a half years. So during that time, um, it really changes your mentality because it actually costs money then to exit Bitcoin and go to dollars. 
So your kind of default is, is Bitcoin. Um, so during that time, as much as possible, I was trying to dog food the Coinbase product as well and basically interact with our own merchant partners and like the shift debit card and uh, use my mobile Bitcoin, Coinbase wallet and things like that. So during that time, I was paying my rent in Bitcoin and I was purchasing a lot of my very large purchases like planes, tickets or, um, you know, hotel rooms with Bitcoin. Uh, then over time, you know, it was paying my friends in Bitcoin when they would, you know, we go out to uh, some pizza or something. I would have them buy my slice and then I would pay them it kind of peer to peer in Bitcoin. So I was trying to do that as much as possible. I, you know, I, I wasn't, um, you know, 100 uh, percent on Bitcoin as in, you know, there were just pragmatic expenses uh, like gasoline or or healthcare or something like that, that you just got to pay in dollars. So. Um, I was doing that as well. So you mentioned uh, Coinbase. You joined. You were the first employee. Is that correct? Or what was it like when you? And how did you end up joining Coinbase? Great question. So um, I was looking at the at the Bitcoin space very closely uh, throughout 2012, and the Bitcoin price had sort of crashed, so to speak. Um, I still felt like the technology was going to change the world. And there were not that many companies at that time. Uh, there was not a lot of venture investment in companies. And a lot of the companies that did exist, I didn't see a, a great future for. Having interacted with a lot of them, um, either you know, by purchasing Bitcoin, uh, I, I didn't feel like there was a sophisticated player in the space yet. So Coinbase came out, and I was actually the 30th user of Coinbase. So... I was very early to their website, and I liked the product a lot. I basically thought that it was sophisticated, and uh, it was easy. You know, it, I didn't have to do anything complicated. And at, this is going to sound silly to listeners now, but I was able to purchase Bitcoin online. And uh, that was something that Coinbase sort of uniquely enabled. And at that time, the easiest way to buy Bitcoin was really to go to a physical location with cash and purchase it from another person or deposit cash into someone's bank account. Uh, now with Coinbase, I was able to purchase using a bank account just over my internet connection. And that um, is actually really hard from Coinbase's perspective to accept those payments via the internet. But they were able to do it. I received my Bitcoin, was able to transfer it off site. Uh, and basically, yeah, it was sold. So I cold emailed jobs at coinbase.com in about February 2013. And I uh, received a reply from Fred, the co-founder, in about 15 minutes. And the rest is history, I guess. I went in and met Brian and Fred. At the time, they were working out of an apartment in Soma and had, had maybe a seed round of funding, about $500,000 or something like that. Uh, spoke to them for a very long time, and I think there was a good fit. I really liked them quite a bit, and uh, I thought they had a very long-term vision, you know, for building sort of an empire, which is what I wanted to to be a part of. So, joined Coinbase as the first employee, and uh, we raised that Series A round of five million dollars from Union Square Ventures, probably uh, two or three months later. And re with regards to that that vision and sort of the enthusiast, the enthusiasm that you had back then. But like many of us first coming into Bitcoin, we're pretty enthusiastic. Do you think that they've, over time, stayed true to that vision? Yeah, so um, not, you know, a ton of people know Brian from Coinbase really well. He is more dedicated to bringing cryptocurrency to everyone in the world than anyone I've ever met. So I, I think that um, Brian, being the CEO and founder, you know, and really being the person who is is driving um, the the culture of the company, driving the vision of the company, um, he is extremely focused and dedicated on bringing this 100% to the mainstream and getting Bitcoin on every mobile phone in the world in everyone's pocket, whether they have a bank account or not, um, and really making sure that all of the tooling around cryptocurrency exists so that people can 
uh, really gain um, more freedom than they might have otherwise by being able to both potentially control their own finances as well as um, interact with new types of products that maybe weren't possible before cryptocurrency was created. So Coinbase has been going through a lot of changes too. I mean, recently they've become more interested in Ethereum. They launched the exchange. Uh, it seems like they are kind of getting interested in the whole uh, token sales, ICO, uh, Realm. What, what's your view of where the company is at and where it is going? So first, uh, we actually um, had Vitalik come to the office and sort of tried to recruit him in 2013. Uh, turned out to be a great thing that he did not join us because um, I'm, I'm very happy that he went on to create Ethereum instead. Um, but we read the white paper when that came out, uh, kind of the day it came out, and I was kind of following the project the whole time. Uh, but it was really once that the network launched that we started taking it more seriously. And um, during that time, uh, I was in a role at Coinbase where I was doing work that was a bit more experimental. And um, I got very, very interested in the Ethereum ecosystem and just what was possible with this Turing complete scripting language. And I realized that it was really enabling a whole suite of applications that were, were much easier or, or to do with Ethereum or just straight impossible to do with Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, really one of my last pushes at Coinbase was to get them to adopt Ethereum. This wasn't just me. I think Fred, uh, the co-founder, was, was also very interested in this, a handful of other people on the team. But um, I, I do think there were a, few, a handful of people at the company that were really pushing at that. Um, once Coinbase adopted Ethereum, that's when I really realized that the um, timing and sort of just general market was ready for something like Polychain. Um, and that was a lot of the inspiration for leaving Coinbase in order to start Polychain. Um, but I think overall, you know, the Ethereum ecosystem is really active right now. And there's a lot of um, experimentation happening. There's a lot of interesting work happening in smart contracts and kind of experimental applications run through smart contracts. So uh, if you're in the crypto space and you're not paying attention to Ethereum, you're, you're missing a lot of where the activity is. And so uh, Coinbase, we've always been, you know, whether it's through our product, it's not usually through the products, but more the team looking at that cutting edge. And um, I think in, you know, Ethereum and ICOs and just kind of tokenization and Ethereum as a token platform, uh, we've been thinking about that stuff a lot. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think it takes a while sometimes for um, Coinbase is at a very massive scale. So to, to ship products to 5 million users safely um, is difficult. So internally, um, a lot of the discussion is usually months and months ahead of, of actual product launches. Uh, you mentioned, and you know, we can probably come back to this later on in the show, but uh, you, know, you, you mentioned that a lot of the action is in the Ethereum space right now, and anyone not watching the Ethereum space is missing out on a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, and I, I'm, you know, I definitely agree with that. I mean, we were just at EdCon a few weeks ago here in Paris, and you know, the, a lot of the enthusiasm, the enthusiasm around Ethereum sort of, you know, echoes uh, the enthusiasm that we was seeing at a, you know, uh, at the Bitcoin uh, Foundation conference uh, in Amsterdam or you know any other other conferences around that time. Um, what are your feelings about the Bitcoin space right now, where it's at, as opposed to like where it may have been you know, a few years ago? You know, I, I think uh, Bitcoin is really different in that because it doesn't really enable smart contracts, there isn't an interesting application layer that is on the protocol. Um, it's, it's really more about companies, you know, private companies building on top of Bitcoin. I think historically, Bitcoin companies have not been successful. If you take like a large swath, um, there's been... $1.4 billion from venture investors invested in Bitcoin companies. And I think I can count on one hand the companies that really have objectively sort of performed well. And maybe I can count them on one finger even hmm. um, if, if we're talking about Coinbase. So I, I, I think 
um, you know, there has been not as much adoption in a lot of the areas people originally thought there might be, like, say, e-commerce, you know, merchant payments, um, even remittances, peer-to-peer -peer remittances, for example, um, I don't think have moved very quickly. So um, all of that combined with, you know, a, a sort of toxic meltdown um, within the community around debates around the best way to scale the protocol, um, to me, has, has created a vacuum for actually something like Ethereum to come in and offer what I view as a lot more um, innovation where it's not just competing with existing business models. It's not a better remittance or a better bank transfer. It's actually enabling new behaviors that were not possible before. When I'm playing blackjack against a smart contract, um, that's new to me. That's interesting. And to me, that I see that as kind of the tip of the iceberg, right? And, you know, this, I, this blackjack game might be um, a prototype. It's slow. It's maybe a little buggy. Um, but it is enabling something that just simply was not possible before. And that's why it's so interesting to me. So I think, I think the Bitcoin space is, um, despite the price rising, I think it's stagnating a little bit. And I think Bitcoin is increasingly becoming uh, mostly sort of an e-gold or store of value. And like, you know, developments like the Bitcoin ETF, um, if that were to be passed, um, would sort of solidify that a bit more. So um, I think Bitcoin is very interesting still as, as e-gold and as a store of value because, that, you know, I don't mean to belittle that. That is a massive use case. Uh, but, you know, I'm increasingly becoming skeptical of, of short or midterm uh, Bitcoin empowering a lot of uh, the original use cases that people imagined. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, it, it definitely has uh, sort of solidified its position as eagle. Now it's unclear where that'll go now. You know, with 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 all of these debates around block size and what have you, and just the the inability for the community, I think, just to come to consensus around like these massive issues. Um, you know, and that you know, on top of uh, sort of Bitcoin's inability to uh, uh, to 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 build these other these other you know interesting applications that we're now seeing with Ethereum or you know other types of protocols. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I I'm I'm still optimistic uh, that um, you know the Bitcoin protocol will will last and will hold this position as sort of the um, the um, leading you know cryptocurrency for for you know payments. Now whether those will whether it will enable uh, micropayments or not is one question, you know, uh, whether it'll be like a, a micropayment uh, enabling platform or simply doing settlements and, and as an e-gold. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I do also have reservations uh, uh, like, like yourself. And I think, I think Brian uh, probably uh, has similar views. What's, what's been interesting is I've been uh, uh, recently I was tweeting a bunch of times, which uh, created this like huge discussions. And <laughs> one of the things that was uh, what was interesting when you know when I got into Bitcoin, right, it was like mid 2013, and then people were saying like, oh, Bitcoin is you know you can do uh, transfer right like for basically nothing to anybody in the world, and it arrives instantly, right? And then you, people were always saying, oh, the the Credit cards are so expensive and they're ripping people off, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And now you're having these discussions and people are like, no, it was never supposed to be cheap. That's what I find <laughs> so fascinating about this whole debate. I was watching that whole Twitter storm and yeah. to see people totally dismiss uh, the instant micropayment, you know, buying mm -hmm. coffee mm -hmm. with Bitcoin use mm -hmm. case uh, when those same people probably though know, three years ago were, were exactly, touting that yeah, as the yeah. major major functionality and feature is just it's incredible to me. Well, and I, I mean I think there's a couple things there. One is there's um, there's I, I think genuinely perhaps unforeseen uh, concerns around the scaling of the technology. So I think a, a lot of the people saying this is going to be better than Western Union, this is going to be micropayments. Um, I, I think we, you know, some people weren't really thinking about how uh, scaling would be addressed because, um, you know, even to reach a global scale, you, you, you need to move to these layer two 
um, networks like Lightning, uh, like the Lightning Network. So I think uh, Lightning Network will work eventually. Um, the, the thing is that um, there is a huge amount of cognitive dissonance, right? When, when you signed up for this project, you invested money in this project, et cetera, that says, um, oh, we're building a global electronic cash network. And um, suddenly it costs a dollar to send a payment on that network, and it didn't used to. I think there's a lot of cognitive dissonance where you want to kind of justify it or, or say that it's all going to as, as planned, um, when I think the reality is no one um, is happy, right, that it costs a dollar instead of a penny uh, to, you know, initiate a Bitcoin transaction. But, um, you know, I think it's just something we need to deal with uh, and to kind of accept the reality of um, instead of trying to redefine uh, the goalposts, right, and, and change in our heads what the goal actually was. Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely feel yeah. that. Yeah, and, and another another uh, s another thing that some guy was arguing was that oh usability, right? Because he was like, oh, it was never supposed to be more user friendly than fiat currencies. Like, there's, there's no chance that cryptocurrency can ever be more user friendly than fiat currency. What? <laughs> and, I, and I also remember, right, like 2013, people would always we would show like, look, look, if you want to book a flight with a credit card, you have to give all this information, address, yeah, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. How easy is it with Bitcoin to scan a QR code? Now people are saying, like, no, no, it's not supposed to be yeah. user-friendly. Yeah. <laughs> Moving the goalposts, yeah. So yeah, you, you said you, you recently left uh, Coinbase to start Polchain. What is Polchain and uh, what's, what's its structure like? Yeah, so uh, Polychain manages a hedge fund that invests exclusively in protocols. So we don't hold shares of any companies. We only invest in, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies, blockchain-based assets, um, and other kind of protocol tokens. And um, when you when you say hedge fund, can you, for people who aren't familiar with mm -hmm. with that, how does a hedge fund work? Yeah. So uh, basically, a hedge fund has a number of partners that all pool money. And then a manager um, basically invests that money on behalf of all of the partners. Um, and so, so that manager generally has a very unique strategy um, that, that's sort of uh, uncorrelated with the market or, um, you know, is, is, is a better, uh, it's better at generating alpha or value than um, something like passively investing in the S&P. Or, or passively, um, in this case, maybe passively buying Bitcoin. And um, I mean, we're going to get a little bit more into the um, nitty and gritty of the investment strategy, but I guess to con contextualize this a little bit, right? One of the challenges, and we've had conversations, I think, also with investors about this a long time ago, uh, is that uh, VCs, for example, aren't allowed really, or at least for the most part, to invest in these assets, right? So it's kind of this space also where institutional investors, existing institutional investors, can't really compete? Mm -hmm. I think um, institutional investors, you know, then there's a lot of different um, if, groups of institutional investors. So there's venture investors, there's family offices, um, there's institutions and endowments. Um, and these are all really different groups of people that actually have very different um, needs and, and different legal obligations and things like that. Um, so I think we focus a lot in, in the crypto world on venture capital, um, but venture capital is actually a pretty small portion of just kind of the overall investable money that people are trying to deploy. Um, I think if you have very high conviction as, one of, um, as a manager of one of these firms, in general it is possible to go to your partners and um, or your your LPs, your limited partners, and uh, convince them that this is such a big opportunity that we're actually going to um, participate here. And I think it's it's perhaps somewhat unusual for um, venture investors to become partners in a fund, um, but that's what has happened with Polychain uh, because there's high conviction here, and it you know Polychain, as you said, can be sort of an avenue for these investors to gain exposure to this uh, asset class without having to purchase them directly. So when you say that Polychain will invest in protocols, 
give us some examples of types of protocols that you may invest in and, and types of um, sort of technologies that you wouldn't invest in then. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I can only talk about investments we've made that are, that are public. Um, but, you know, in the portfolio, we, of course, hold the much larger cap things like um, Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, we also are invested in a lot of uh, smaller, more emerging protocols. Um, so, for example, uh, MKR, or Maker, is a uh, ERC-20 token on top of Ethereum that we made sort of a public investment in. Uh, we are also invested in things that aren't um, built on Ethereum. So, for example, Tezos. Uh, which is a also a Turing complete blockchain like Ethereum, but it has some really interesting qualities that differentiate it, and I think provides some usefulness um, outside of what Ethereum does. So um, it's really all over the place. Anything that is based on the blockchain, um, we can invest in. Anything that's kind of an open source protocol, you'll invest in like low level protocols like Ethereum, but also applications built on top yes. of those protocols. Yeah. Well, and we, yeah, any, anything that sort of is, is, um, cause I, you know, even those higher level protocols, I guess I use the word protocol a little loosely here. Uh, but yeah, we'll invest in application specific tokens as well as low level protocols. Okay. And so you mentioned before that you were just to revisit very briefly what we were talking before that you were raising, uh, some money uh, was coming from VCs that essentially use Polchain as a sort of avenue to invest in tokens. So how much, uh, you know, what's the size of your fund now and, and where would you like to take that? And do you do you think much of it is going to come from VCs who are interested in this space or are you more, what kind of uh, investors are you looking for? Yeah, so um, we currently have 15 million under management. 15 million US dollars. Um, I, I think this fund will be capped um, at some level. Um, some, it's, it's hard to say exactly because as the space expands, it actually becomes possible to manage more and more money. Uh, but in this case, you know, a lot of funds, uh, hedge funds, will grow to billions of dollars. In the, with the current size of the space, this fund's strategy would not scale to that. Uh, so this fund will be capped at some level. Um, I, I think most of the investors that are, are going to invest in the polychain fund are not VCs. Um, and like I said, you know, most startups are familiar exclusively with venture investors. Um, but I'm actually, I work a lot more closely with fund allocators. So these are in general um, family offices. So a family office is basically a very a micro investment firm set up by a high net worth individual to manage their assets and family offices don't have the kind of resources in general that a venture investor does so family offices don't sit, take seats on boards um, they generally don't want voting rights uh, they want to be passive investors so uh, family offices are some of the most common partners in hedge funds they're some of the most common fund allocators especially for emerging funds um, you know, once once we have say a two year track record, at that point we can start talking to more uh, large scale allocators, and these are things like endowments um, or foundations managing uh, money. But generally speaking, venture investors are actually not who uh, we're talking to because venture investors aren't usually who can allocate to funds. Yeah, I mean, of course, there's also a little bit of a a uh, bizarre situation with, uh, with a venture investor because they're getting money from somebody else and then, then they take their like fee for making the right allocations, but then they give it to you and you yep. invest it and you take another fee, right? So it's hard to justify mm -hmm. that even. Yep, exactly. Let's take a short break to talk about Jax. Jax is your wallet, your complete user interface to cover all your blockchain needs. I've been using it and I've been loving it. Now, Jax supports a lot of different cryptocurrencies. It supports Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin, Ethereum Classic, Zcash, Augur Rep, 
and they're adding many more, keep responding to users' needs. Now with Jax, the nice thing is that you can manage all of those coins within a single wallet and you are in control of your own private keys, they're not on their server. And there's a single 12 word seed that you can use to back up your wallet, all your coins and sync them across different devices. Talking about devices, they're on pretty much any device that you can think of. You can get it on PC, Mac, Linux, you can get it on smartphones like Android and Apple and iPhone, you can get it on tablets or even, there are even browser extensions for Chrome and Firefox. And on top of that, in JAX, you can actually exchange different cryptocurrencies for each other because they've integrated a shapeshift. And more partnerships and integrations are coming down the line in 2017 that are going to make JAX even better. So JAX is really making blockchain and cryptocurrencies accessible for the masses, easy to use for the masses. Make sure, sure to get your own JAX wallet at JAX.io or you can get it from any of the app stores you are using. We'd like to thank JAX for their support of Epicenter. How would you summarize the, the investment thesis of Polychain? So really, broadly speaking, and I think many listeners might kind of agree with this assessment, um, so the market capitalization of all blockchain-based assets um, has grown precipitously. Um, so when I wrote my undergraduate thesis and published that, I think, you know, early 2012, um, the market capitalization was $50 million of basically all blockchain-based assets. And... Um, now it's closer to $25 billion um, or, you know, a 500x increase in value. And um, that's been fantastic growth over the last uh, five, and five years. But I think that um, we will continue to see, um, you know, immense growth in this space. So someday I believe that there will be trillions of dollars uh, stored in blockchain-based assets. And some of this will be sort of native or endogenous to the blockchain. Some of this will be real world or more traditional types of assets encoded into the blockchain. Um, so we're talking about a, a area that is extremely nascent and I believe will grow substantially um, over the next say five or 10 years. Um, that's pretty easy um, to see. I think a lot of people see that. Uh, more specifically, though, you know, how do you invest once you see that? Um, so we're very much interested in the what I would call sort of the, the decentralized or the Web3 internet stack. So um, when you think about Twitter, the protocol competing with Twitter, the company, um, you know, that's really exciting to me. Um, and kind of a peer to peer sensorless version of Twitter is really exciting to me that's totally global and not run by a specific company, but rather is it just completely a protocol. Now, the issue there, though, is that Twitter, the company and the platform, is built on a massive stack of web technologies that are often sort of invisible to the end user. Um, so this is like HTTP and, and kind of being in the browser. This is SSL so that your traffic's encrypted. Um, th this is just kind of your server stack. So you're, you're interacting with like a Twitter data center um, you also have a stable login and, and you know, identity and reputation on Twitter. Um, all of these are, are components of this internet stack that was built long before Twitter and that Twitter sort of had to combine in modular pieces in order to get the Twitter platform um, into place. So I, I, think, I think it's a little early right now for something like Twitter the protocol. The reason being that we need things like IPFS and Filecoin, uh, things like Gollum, um, you know, which, which is a computational marketplace, um, things like Uport and kind of identity and reputation systems. Um, we need you know, projects like MetaMask that enable you to interact with smart contracts in the browser. You really need this, these kind of low level infrastructure and kind of middleware layer to rebuild that whole web, you know, the decentralized stack or, or the web three stack which kind of mimics a lot of the centralized web stack. And you need to be able to combine all of that stack in, in, in kind of modular parts in order to get the more emergent um, behavior like Twitter the protocol. So um, to us, you know, projects that are enabling that distributed or decentralized web stack are very, very interesting.
Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, one of the things that I often say to people when comparing sort of, you know, traditional web stacks to these decentralized technology stack is you know, if you can look at just about any, any type of application that we build on web stacks, say an e-commerce website, and, you know, you have a, uh, a, a, an array of stacks, right? So you can build e-commerce websites on like Magento, PHP, MySQL, Apache, Apache, Linux, you know, you can do, you can do it like maybe on like a, an ASP stack and, you know, there's stacks that are there and they're validated and tested and they're, you know, they work and people use them massively. But in the blockchain space, you know, there are applications, there are use cases, there are types of things that people are doing, but these stacks are not well-defined, um, interoperable, like the, the different layers are not always super interoperable together. And a lot of the technologies are still kind of in a very nascent state. So I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in seeing, you know, those stacks starting to, um, starting to form and, you know, these, uh, you know, like technologies coming together around specific use cases and people pointing to those as, um, as sort of, you know, references and how you build a certain type of app on a blockchain. Do you, do you see some of that starting to emerge? Uh, you know, do you, are there applications where you can see, you know, sort of stacks uh, emerging? Yeah, and I, you know, I almost wouldn't call them applications because I think applications sort of assumes um, a, a what I would call like an average or normal end user. Um, I think we're looking at right now more like middleware. Um, so, for example, something like Gollum, um, which is a, a peer-to-peer marketplace for computation uh, powered by an ERC-20 token on Ethereum called GNT or Gollum Network Token. Uh, I, I think that... Um, Gollum, to me, won't really be used by sort of normal people. I view Gollum as being a developer tool so that a developer can build, um, you know, an emergent kind of end-user application. Um, And I I think, you know, Filecoin, which powers IPFS or the Interplanetary File System, which is a distributed server architecture, um, I think similarly... You know, I, I see IPFS really being a tool for developers to build more complicated emergent applications. Um, so I think we're seeing that kind of middleware layer. You know, and you're seeing that on the not just on the kind of Web3 side, but also on the on the financial side. So um, I think Maker uh, MakerDAO or MKR, um, you know, the ultimate goal of that project is to build a stable cryptocurrency that's fully decentralized, and um, that to me is, is, is sort of the equivalent of a kind of financial middleware, right? So the, a stable coin um, in itself isn't necessarily the end application. It, it's really that the stable coin stays stable while you're in escrow waiting for an e-commerce purchase to complete or uh, while you're um, giving out a loan, right? That, that the, the actual asset you loaned isn't changing in value uh, for the duration of that loan. So to me, um, I, I view a stablecoin also sort of as, as that kind of lower level or middleware layer that enables um, more advanced end user applications like peer-to-peer loans, peer-to-peer credit, things like that. Yeah, okay, that, that makes sense. So then the, you know, the, the stack could be composed of you know, different front-end applications, front-end um, uh, tools, uh, some storage, you know, a coin, uh, you know, smart contracting language. And then with that, you can build, you know, perhaps some sort of application like, I don't know, Fidelity Point system or like a e-commerce payment system or something, something like that. Um, you wrote uh, somewhere, I, I read that you that you wrote that we're moving towards a system where our smart contracts are like Lego pieces. And yep. in, in this, you know, if we if you sort of take this idea of, you know, stacks, um, you know, what type of pieces then could we see uh, emerging within, you know, those different application types? Yeah, so, um, and, and the context uh, there was we were talking about the DAO um, and kind of, you know, what went wrong there. And I think part of it was, um, and like the, the first person that really talked to me about this um, eloquently was Nikolai, who's the lead developer behind Maker. Um, I, th- I think, you know, thinking about the architecture of smart contracts is really important. And so when you're building a traditional uh, web application, you, you generally want to architect these days, the, the kind of m- most premier way to do this is a service-oriented architecture or SOA. And this is where um, 
you know, your architecture of your application isn't on one monolithic code base, but is rather on different um, modular parts that each serve a very precise function, but that can all interact. This means that um, if one modular piece fails, um, like maybe only your site's API goes down, but the web interface stays up for all your users. Um, so this is the, the benefit of a service-oriented architecture is that you don't get catastrophic system-wide failure. You know, an individual piece can be upgraded or fail or things like that without bringing down the whole system. So when we're thinking about how to build really complex um, smart contract built based applications, like for example, a user uh, uh, you know, controlled and owned venture firm, which is what the DAO was trying to do. I don't think um, on principle you know, that that is an untenable idea. I think it's, it's technically possible. Um, it's just a question of how to architect that so that it's kind of the safest. And I think um, the Lego pieces metaphor resonates with me because each smart uh, contract can perform a very specific function, can be extremely uh, battle tested, you know, both in the field as well as by security researchers. It can be very carefully audited um, and just used widely such that we can feel confident that that very specific small modular smart contract um, works. And from there, smart contracts can be combined to build more complicated emergent behavior. Sort of like Lego pieces, um, each individual piece is very simple, um, but when you combine them, of course, you get sort of very quickly an exponentially rising number of possible combinations. So um, I think that's probably um, where smart, contract, you know, smart contracts will go in the future is a kind of more modular set of very well battle-tested contracts. Um, but we'll see. I think th these things are so emergent, it's hard to know sometimes. There's been a lot of um, of this kind of fundamental technology built in the past, right? That powers the internet, HTTP, SMTP, etc. And it seems like the pattern in the past was that those protocols weren't monetized, but that then on top of it, you know, people will build Gmail and Google and Twitter and all of those things, uh, and those would turn out to be big businesses. So here, right, when we're looking at what you were talking about about now, those would be projects that are kind of more building, uh, replacing these fundamental uh, protocol layers. And, and then, you know, you pointed out that, okay, once those pieces are in place, it would be possible to build, you know, decentralized Gmail, decentralized Twitter, etc. Mm -hmm. Do you think that in the end, we will though see a kind of a shift of where the money is made and the value is created towards the protocol? Or do you also feel like that the biggest uh, returns in the end will be uh, on the level of these applications that we built on top, but it's just, you know, it's too early right now. So I have a pretty strong opinion on this. Um, I, I really do think that in this space, the value will be created at the protocol level and not at the application layer. Um, I don't think this is an entirely new idea. If you look historically, the best bet in the entire Bitcoin space was Bitcoin, the protocol, um, not any of these specific companies built on top. Even Coinbase, which save for the seed round investors in Coinbase, that has been an absolutely fabulous return. Um, but when they did that seed round, uh, Bitcoin was about $5. And if they would have purchased Bitcoin, I think they would see pretty similar fabulous return. Um, so to me, um, this isn't a totally new idea. You know, and the, the best investment in the Ethereum ecosystem obviously is Ether, uh, ha or has been Ether historically, um, more so than it, it was any investment in any private company built on Ethereum. So um, I think this is starting to be empirically true. I think looking forward, um, when you can bet on the protocol, because all applications built on top of the protocol require you to actually utilize that protocol. Um, I think this means that really disproportionate value goes to that protocol layer, more so than the applications built on top of it. Um, and U Union Square Ventures, who's um, one of Polychain's investors, um, they have a strong thesis around this as well. And um, Joel Monegro, who, who works at USV and is a, a great thinker in this space, uh, 
wrote a post about this called um, Fat Protocols. And this is about how value in this space is created um, more so at the protocol layer than the application layer. And it, what, it, what I would suggest is if you look back in time um, at, at sort of the emergence of just the normal web, the normal internet, um, we might think of the best investments as Google, Facebook, Amazon, things like that. Um, I would challenge that if it were possible to own, say, 1% of the TCP IP protocol, that that actually would have been the best investment you could have made. Um, because the TCP IP protocol or the SMTP protocol or whatever it is um, grows in use um, for each application built on top. So, you know, that protocol, um, it, it basically becomes more and more valuable with each individual application that's built on top of it. Um, so to me, being able to buy Ether um, and invest in the protocol of Ethereum and basically be an, you know, what is essentially an equity owner in Ethereum um, is extremely powerful. If any of these networks um, or protocols becomes ubiquitous on the internet, like I believe, uh, say, Ethereum could be, um, the upside of that investment is astronomical. Um, so even if that probability is viewed as very low, um, I, I think um, things like Ethereum are a fabulous bet, even if you're extremely skeptical, because the upside is so great. Cool, excellent. No, I think that was uh, well, well put. Now, let, let's move to one of the topics that's probably on many people's mind, which is the topic of crowd sales and, uh, and what's often called uh, ICOs. So those have been really uh, taking off, I think, uh, I saw some stats that in the last, was it six months or something, there was as much money invested in the whole blockchain space uh, through ICOs uh, as was through traditional VC. Uh, and that, that, you know, probably, or maybe this was for last year and that this year, you know, it's a good chance it's even going to overtake that. What's your view of the current um, state of this ICO and crowd sale uh, wave? So... On a very high level, I think it's incredibly interesting that we are seeing um, what, what I would call a handful of unprecedented effects. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll say what I think those are. So one is that, um, broadly speaking, we are seeing open source uh, founders, so founders of peer-to-peer -peer open source protocols, um, are able to raise money just to develop their protocol. Um, I think this is absolutely amazing because open source has always been um, built usually for ideological reasons um, and it, it never really has been monetized in this way where you have a great idea, um, you have an excellent white paper, you assemble an excellent team and now you can actually uh, you know, be monetized to actually bu you know, build that protocol, build that peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, that's a never really happened before. Additionally, the fact that these teams can take an equity stake in their networks um, and actually, you know, hold some of the tokens for themselves and gain um, the upside that looks sort of like a startup founder. Um, when you start a company, you know, you, you're usually the largest equity owner in that company. And if that, if you can make that company 100 times larger, you know, the value of that equity goes up by 100 times. And I think that we're seeing that effect, that kind of economic incentive mechanism from startups uh, be mimicked by um, open source founders. And I, I think that's also a sort of unprecedented effect. One, that these projects can get money, and two, that the creators are really incentivized financially to build a successful project. Um, on the flip side of that, and, the, and these kind of crowd sales, is that the users of the network are the equity owners of the network. So, um, you know, when you're on Twitter or you're on Facebook or you're on Uber or Airbnb, Etsy, Tumblr, whatever, um, you're contributing to that platform, but you do not own that platform. Somebody else owns it and ultimately is extracting value from all of the interactions between the people on that platform. Um, in the case of these peer-to-peer uh, -peer models, um, the users are the equity owners, and when you contribute value, in a sense, you also gain a very a, a piece of that value uh, based on your equity ownership. So, this idea of founders um, of open source and peer-to-peer -peer protocols being able to monetize um, their networks, 
um, to have an equity stake in their network and also for that network to be owned by the users. All of these, in my mind, are pretty much unprecedented effects. Um, and the fact that Ethereum has been become really a platform for the launch of digital assets um, through the ERC-20 standard um, so that you know, developers can focus just on their spe you know, specific application that this token is powering instead of having to rebuild uh, mining algorithms, consensus mechanisms, and the, the whole kind of blockchain stack and getting to scale um, so that your, your blockchain is secure. The fact that all of that is abstracted away by Ethereum and that developers can just focus on the actual digital asset and the mechanics of that uh, digital asset is um, amazing. So to me, you know, on a really high level, I think we're seeing um, a lot of trends here with crowd sales that um, are, are very big and very important to look at carefully. Um, now, all of that said, I think the specific mechanisms we're seeing often play out in the space right now um, are pretty basic, as in um, there's a reason venture capital works the way it does and it has kind of emerged the way it does. So for example, when you raise money for a company, you don't take one big lump sum and then you know use that money forever. Um, you raise a seed round, a series A round, series B round, and you kind of take capital at different, um, different amounts of capital at, at different uh, stages of your company that makes sense. And you get diluted in different amounts based on those kinds of round of funding and everything. So right now, I think with ICOs, we're, we're not quite there. We're mostly in like a, you know, hey, I'm launching, I'm raising money, and it's a done deal. Um, and so I, I think we're actually going to see the ecosystem move more towards a uh, the, the structures that traditional venture financing created. Uh, because I think I think they were created for a pretty good reason. Um, but yeah, I, I am, as you can probably tell, I'm obviously very excited about um, the prospects of, of monetizing peer-to-peer -peer networks and um, really rewarding the creators of those peer-to-peer -peer networks. Yeah, no, I, I think you're put, putting it out very well. And, and I think you're totally right to that raising in different stages and, you know, not selling all the tokens kind of in one go uh, is going to be quite important for projects. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if we're going to see some, some challenges for projects down the line that, you know, that risk uh, all that money at once. I mean, I think uh, even Ethereum, uh, they got kind of lucky with the Ether price just taking off uh, at the right time. But otherwise, the Ethereum Foundation would have run out of money at this point. Mm -hmm. so, so given that... What is your thing? Because, you know, looking at this from, you could look at these projects and you see the amount of money they're raising and the kind of stage they're at. And often, you know, if they went to a VC, they probably wouldn't be uh, far enough and they probably wouldn't be able to raise significant amounts of money. Or often they might say, okay, we're going to maybe invest in a seed, seed round kind of company, but now they're raising maybe 10 million or something. Do you think that there is a problem of, of just too much money going into his projects and them being uh, overvalued? So I, I have a couple thoughts there. So one is that um, I think it's great that these projects are being opened up to people outside of venture capital. Um, and I think that it's fantastic that startup style returns um, have been given to regular people, like purchasers of Bitcoin from the early days, purchases of Ether in, say, the crowd sale of Ethereum, um, have seen fantastic returns, and they were not venture investors. Um, so right now, just in a macro environment, we're in a place where, um, you know, venture is limited to a kind of elite group of people uh, that all have to be accredited investors or, or qualified clients um, and, and basically have stringent net worth requirements. Most of these requirements were put in place um, after the um, Great Depression in like the 30s. So um, to me, that limits all the best investment opportunities or, or rather the, the highest potential upside investment opportunities um, to a very exclusive and elite group of people. Um, Instead, with these token sales, that it kind of democratizes that access and gives anyone access to these very early stage projects. Um, so maybe what we're seeing is that there's more market demand 
for these early stage projects than people thought. And when you open that up to the to anyone, that actually um, it's sort of like a Kickstarter style um, fundraise where you can raise a little bit from a lot of different people instead of you know a, a couple of huge checks from one or two venture investors. Um, so maybe there's just more money on the sidelines for early stage projects than people realized. Um, the second thing, though, is I, I do think specifically for some of the projects in the space, there is, um, in my view, a bit of irrational exuberance, I would call it, around some of these token launches. Um, now, that said, I, I think individuals can disagree with the market, but um, I, I, I do trust that um, the market is efficient in, in some way. So um, the amount of money being put in here, um, you know, who, who knows, basically? Um, maybe, maybe some of these projects um, end up being 1,000x returns. And in that case, um, the maybe seemingly high valuation at this early stage for a lot of these projects maybe was justified because there was sort of a, a, a unicorn, so to speak, among them. Yeah, so around you know this idea of uh, irrational exuberance uh, around some of these projects, and you know, I, I do, do agree that some projects, you know, we, we we see all this money flowing in, and uh, and there's nothing really behind it, or perhaps uh, you know technically it's not on solid. The projects aren't being built on solid ground, or that kind of thing. Uh, do you think that you know at some point we may see some sort of a crowd sale bubble that could affect uh, negatively the the price of the underlying assets like Bitcoin and, and Ether? If there is a crowd sale bubble, I think we're maybe already past the peak. Um, you know, uh, with with the Dow and a lot of projects late last year. So, um, you know, I, I think it's possible. Uh, I, I at the same time though, I, I think this kind of crowdfunding mechanism um, is here to stay. And even if there are kind of um, waxes and wanes or swings in in the activity. Um, I think net net um, that irrational exuberance is maybe um, it's it's often the, the signal of a larger trend. So uh, with Bit, you could argue say that in Bitcoin in 2013, when the price went to a thousand, that that was really irrational exuberance. Um, but now I, I think we see in hindsight that um, a lot of those people maybe were right. It's just the timing was maybe off a little bit. Um, and people were seeing something really big that just wasn't quite production ready that year, um, but was maybe production ready two or three years out. So, um, yeah, I, I think we could see swings, but um, I think that this this idea of token launching and, and raising money through tokens is here to stay. You mentioned the DAO. From an, uh, an investor perspective, what effect do you think that may have on um, their desire to invest in, you know, in these tokens and future crowd sales? So the DAO was extraordinarily intellectually interesting in that um, I do think that future DAOs will work and will be a very important part of this ecosystem. So I think the unfortunate part of that effect is that it made people um, skeptical of the concept of a DAO. Um, when I actually think that that's a very important concept. Um, and, and a DAO just quickly being a decentralized autonomous organization. So I think this idea of conferring voting rights and fund allocation based on the community um, for a very specific purpose actually you know, has its use cases potentially and is a very big idea. I think it's the classic example of something that's uniquely enabled by uh, this technology and and really wasn't possible before. Um, now that said, um, I think there was obviously way too much money dumped into the DAO for where it was as a project, um, and I, I think that that should have been like a tiny experiment that got a little bit out of hand. Um, so to me. Um, yeah, it, it, it may be correctly tempered investors' interests and showed them you can't just dump money into anything. You have to actually you know, still have a very critical lens um, when you're examining these projects. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I get partially why that happened. It's just because the DAO was so intellectually interesting. 
um, that it was hard not to participate for some people because they felt like, oh, I, you know, I want to be part of the future, essentially. Um, even though from an investor perspective, as in, was the Dow going to make um, spectacular venture returns? Probably not. And I, I think a lot of people probably knew that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I see where you're coming from. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think to an investor to properly evaluate and assess whether or not a project is technically viable, which, you know, for all intents and purposes, the, the, the Dow uh, crash or hack was a, was a technical issue. I think for most people who invested in it or even observers of the space, there was really no way of knowing that that would happen. Do you think that perhaps this has instilled some sort of skepticism, perhaps instilled some skepticism uh, for investors to, you know, maybe invest in some uh, you know, uh, really interesting uh, projects, but because um, they don't have the ability or uh, the experience to examine them uh, technically may uh, hinder the space uh, with regards to, you know, raising sort of, you know, venture money and like money from, um, not from within the space, but yeah, like investor money. Yeah. Um, I think if, if it created any skepticism, it's healthy skepticism. Uh, I, I think it's really important that people understand what they're investing in, uh, which I think in the case of the Dow, a lot of people really didn't. Um, and, and maybe didn't understand the, the risk, right? Any investment and in anything in this ecosystem is extraordinarily risky, and, you know, including Ethereum, including Bitcoin. So I, I think that um, a lot of people maybe forget that. Do you think that investors really get how risky it is? I mean, because there's there's obviously sort of the, the speculative risk and that sort of stuff. But do people when you when you when you really start looking into these technologies, I mean, even as observers of the space, I mean, like you know, we, we can we can say that you know, these are not battleground tested technologies. Like you know, we're not really sure what's going to happen when Ethereum moves to proof of stake. Like these. Do you, there's enormous risk around all these um, projects um, uh, that we sort of take for granted. But do you think people really comprehend the, the amount of risk? I think so. I mean, I don't know. I think some people do. Others, maybe not. Um, I, you know, I, I think that the upside is so large. And that's one thing that everyone gets. Um, that on some level, the risk assessment um, is, is like it still makes sense to invest in some of these things, even if you think there's a 1% chance of success because the upside is more than 100x, in which case, if as an investment, you know, that's a good investment. So hmm. um, I, I, I think, you know, and you could even say that about Ether itself, that, you know, I consider Ethereum very risky. Um, obviously, I'm very excited about Ethereum. I think Ethereum... Um, the, the upside on the market cap is, is massive, and I think the probability of failure is, is pretty high, too. So, um, you know, knowing there's a lot of risk doesn't mean you, you shouldn't invest. But, um, yeah, I think it's across the board people's different uh, assessment there. So before we wrap up here, I wanted to ask you about, uh, yeah, so about Bitcoin and Ether, these underlying assets. Um, recently, you know, we've seen the price of Bitcoin uh, come up to you know, the levels that, that it was back in the early uh, 2014 and even higher. And, the, and also we've seen the price of Ethereum, of Ether uh, come up uh, to, some, you know, sort of like $20. Right now, uh, you know, there's, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of speculation around you know, the, the, these underlying technologies, and that's what's driving the price up. Uh, when we see more and more apps being developed uh, on the core protocols, what do you think will drive the price uh, of, of these core, core tokens in the future? I mean, just more use cases for real consumers, um, like real people that aren't kind of weird crypto geeks. Um, I think that's going to be the key driver is if we can um, see something like Twitter, the protocol get really big, you know, because um, users are remunerated um, in, a, in, a, in a creative way. And suddenly you get money for retweets and some 14 year old makes a million dollars like um, that's big. Right. So um, I think it's going to need to at the end of the day, of course, be kind of scale scaled end user applications. 
Um, in the meantime, though, it's it's mostly people betting on the future and betting on that future sort of speculatively uh, based on progress in the ecosystem um, and increasing that probability of those end user applications emerging. I, I think it's it's hard to know exactly what drives um, all these prices, but I think it's it's often just people realizing how big the potential is here. Well, Olaf, uh, thanks so much for coming on and, and sharing a bit about uh, Polychain and your vision today. It was super interesting talking with you, and I'm excited to see where the fund goes and where this uh, whole space goes as well. I mean, I think you are also at the very, very beginning of what's probably going to be a whole wave of investment funds that are going to pursue similar strategies like you. So that's extremely exciting to, to learn about. Yeah. And uh, thanks for having me. And, and yeah, I do think that the space is seeing unprecedented growth right now. So I'm, I'm sure there will be many uh, other funds doing what I'm doing. Cool. So uh, there, there are quite a few resources. Uh, I mean, Olaf's articles and some other articles and some of the concepts we've talked about. So we'll link to those in the show notes. Now, uh, just one piece of information for our listeners as well. So we have, you, you probably noticed, we have often been releasing episodes on Tuesday instead of Monday like we used to. So we are uh, moving to releasing them on Tuesday basically always. And we think we should be able to release them on time that way, uh, almost always. I'm sure sometimes it will be Wednesday still. But, uh, but so yeah, so keep a, keep a lookout for the episodes on Tuesday. And yeah, with that, we are at the end of our shows. Thanks so much for tuning in once again. Uh, we are part of the Let's Bitcoin network, so you can find this show and other shows on uh, letstopbitcoin.com. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. If you want to so support the show, then please leave us an iTunes review. And we look forward to being back next week. Thank you.